Want to know how to score 260 plus on step two? I'm going to share five stories of students who weren't good at standardized tests, but still managed to crush the exam. If you want to learn how to do something, learn from people who aren't naturally good. That way, you know their process can be repeated, not that they're just geniuses. Each of these five struggled. Two of them even failed the USMLE, but then they figured it out, and so can you. Our first story is a student that I'll call Commitment. I'm changing their names, obviously, because some of these students have actually failed their exams, as I mentioned. In order to be able to tell their stories fully, I'm not gonna use their real names. Commitment was in many ways a typical Caribbean medical student. He was someone who hadn't necessarily done great in undergrad and didn't have like really, really high scores, but was hardworking and was resilient and so ended up in one of the Caribbean medical schools. I started working with him when he was starting his clerkships and he had struggled up until that point. He'd failed one of his preclinical exams, so he had actually been at risk of getting kicked out of school, and he needed extra time to prepare for step one, which was overall a pretty disappointing experience for him. So he knew that he had to change some things because he wasn't really on a trajectory to stand out in the way that he wanted to as a Caribbean medical student. When he first entered clerkships, it actually continued to be a struggle. In medical education, there is these concepts of service versus learning, right? And when you're on the wards, there is a degree that you just have to get stuff done, which is the service part. And then there is the education part or the learning part, which is like didactics and things like that. And so in his experience, he was actually having a lot of service, right? Like he was just doing a lot of stuff. He was basically taking on the role of like a medical assistant. He was turning over rooms, he was drawing labs, he was running things, he was doing like paperwork type stuff. And he was just busy all the time. In addition to that, his attending had these expectations of presentations that he would give. And so he didn't really have a lot of time, but what he did have was a lot of excuses. And so he would say like, you know, like, I don't, I don't know when I'm supposed to study. Like, I know that I should be doing cards. I, I know I should be doing questions, but I'm just really struggling to do it. It took a conversation. And so I sat him down and I said, look, there's a lot of reasons why it is that you aren't doing you know, enough questions, you're not doing enough cards. I get it, I totally understand. But if you look at where you are and how much you're doing and what your trajectory is, I don't think that this is gonna end up where you want it to end. And so he took that to heart. He adopted the no zero day philosophy, which meant that he would have no days where he did nothing. And in fact, he said, I want my worst days to be better than other people's best days. He was gonna do whatever it took to get stuff done. And so what was remarkable is, is that from that day forward, he was like a man possessed. He took the attitude of, I need to get this minimum amount of studying done. And in the time remaining, I will do the other things, right? In the time remaining, I will work on, you know, the presentation or whatever it is that I have to give tomorrow. But I'm going to pay myself first by doing my studying and prioritizing that over everything else. And so from that point on, I mean, he his shelf scores started, you know, going up. He would score on like the high 80s or low 90s. And it wasn't a surprise when he scored a 262 on step two. What's ironic is, is that he actually was somewhat disappointed with the score because his two previous NBMEs before he took step one were 275 and 280, which also gives you an idea of how important it is if you wanna score high to have a buffer in case something happens on your test and you score below where it is that you predicted. Our second student we're gonna call determination. She is the epitome of grit. Because of the fact that she was a non-USIMG without a green card, she'd failed one of her USMLEs, she didn't have any connections, she didn't have a ton of research, she knew that her back was against the wall. Instead of getting desperate, she got determined. She said, I'm gonna do whatever it takes, including more than I think is necessary in order to ensure that I get the kind of score that's going to keep doors open for me in ob -Gain. And so she said, however long it takes, whatever it's going to take, I'm going to do that thing and more. And so she started her first NBME was a 202. And in under three months, she had scored a 262 on her practice test. Now, most of us at that point would have said, great, I've achieved it. I'm going to, I'm going to move forward. But in her case, she said, no, this is not enough. I haven't gotten through all of the things that I can do so that I can walk out of my test knowing that I gave it my all. She actually spent several months after that continuing to study. She did an extra Q bank. She did all of the practice tests, including I think she did all of the, like the shelf NBMEs. Like she did literally everything that she could think of while also simultaneously working on her skills of question interpretation, making really excellent Anki cards, you know, making sure that she understood it so that her knowledge just kept growing over this time. And so it wasn't surprising that when she took her test, she got a 261 and eventually matched at her top choice program in residency. She's now a fellow in 
one of the most competitive fellowships in all of medicine, REI, which is Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. I think one of the biggest lessons that she typifies is she wasn't trying to match a particular deadline. She just said, I don't care how long it takes, I'm going to do whatever it takes in order to get the score, and that's what she did. Our third story comes from someone that I'll call active learning. So she's someone that knew that she'd wanted to go into a competitive specialty from the beginning, dermatology. She's the only student on this list that I felt comfortable talking about that I hadn't tutored one-on-one. -on -one. And the reason why I feel comfortable talking about her story is, is because I still remember her so well from the course that she was in. She'd started in our course probably two years before she ended up taking her test. And I remember that she was just always actively participating. She was doing things like asking questions and checking to, you know, to make sure that her cards were good. And she was always clarifying things, doing things that frankly, all of us could be doing, but are oftentimes uncomfortable. In many ways, it actually reminded me of when I was starting out in medical school, I had asked myself the question, what is it that I could do such that I can maximize every single learning opportunity that I have in front of me? When I went to class, I would, commit to asking questions of the lecturers either during the lecture or more often, I would save up my questions and ask them after the lecture was finished. Doing this did a couple things for me. One is since I knew that I was going to ask them a question afterwards, I had to pay attention better because I didn't want to look like an idiot who would go up and have to ask a question, but have it be like this really poorly formed question. Two is it gave me a lot of extra opportunities to find further information. I think some of the most interesting connections and interesting concepts that I learned in medical school actually came from these conversations. These are things that every single person in medical school is capable of doing, but I was really one of the only, if not the only person that was following this particular strategy. And I think the reason was, is that it's uncomfortable, right? It's really uncomfortable to do, to take on that active learning role. The reason why this student really stood out is, is because you could tell that she was willing to push through that discomfort. She was willing to do whatever it took in order to maximize her learning, not necessarily to maximize her comfort. She ended up scoring at 265 on step two, which again is not surprising considering how well she'd mastered the material up until that point. Our fourth story is who we'll call high quality work quickly. I've been doing this long enough that I have actually tutored entire families of people. So I've actually tutored her two siblings, the eldest of which is a practicing plastic surgeon who I believe I knew either as a medical student or maybe as a resident. When she first came to me, her starting score was a 210, which is slightly below passing for step two. The issue is, is that she wants to be an ophthalmologist. And so she needed to have a much higher score much faster because she wasn't willing to take extra time off. And so what she did is she worked like a machine with just intense dedication. The reason why I highlight her is, is that she put an extraordinary volume of work in every single day while still maintaining high quality. This is something that's really hard. It's kind of like, you know, when you're applying to college and you ask like, should I take the easier class and get an A or should I take the harder class and get a B? And then, you know, some schools they'll say like, you should take the harder class and get an A, right? It's kind of like that. That's essentially what she did. She just showed up every single day and had a really objective attitude of saying, okay, like tell me what I'm doing wrong. And then she would come and she would have this list of questions of all the things that she wanted to talk about before our sessions. And she would just say like, hit me with it. Like, just tell me all the things that I'm doing wrong. Tell me the things that I can do better. And then she would go and she would change it and she would do the work and she would make, have really fast turnaround and everything such that she improved her score from a 210 to a 268. Our final story is one that I'll call comeback. And I think that there's a number of students that we could describe as sort of comeback stories, but I think this one typifies it the most. Here's a student who, failed step one very, very narrowly. He goes to one of the University of California schools and up until that point, he'd been fine. Like he'd done fine. His NBMEs weren't great, but they were still in the passing rain. When he got the report saying that he'd failed, he was just crushed. He has a background of major depression and severe ADHD. So this hit him like a sack of bricks. He was stuck in bed, just could not leave his room because he was just so down. The first time I met him, actually, I met him with his mother. And the reason is, is that she had basically staged an intervention and said like, we've got to do something. We have got to get you out of bed and get you back on your feet because he was just so, so down on himself. Despite the fact that he was pretty skeptical, he was, however, open to change. And specifically, he was open to doing whatever it took to overcome his pain because he was in just such a deep and dark 
place. What he did is he basically decided, I wanna channel my pain of failure into a transformation. I don't want to just pass my test. I want to crush this test. He basically said, I wanna have an extreme makeover where I score so high that there is virtually zero chance of me ever failing this or any other exam in the future. And he worked like a man possessed. He went to bed like early, like I, I think he was going to bed at like 8.30. He was waking up at about 4.30. He was going to the gym regularly. He also lost a ton of weight and completely transformed his body while he simultaneously transformed his mindset. And so he did everything. Everything that he learned, he learned really, really well. Everything he learned, he made sure that he never, ever, ever forgot it. And he had that same attitude of, okay, like tell me what it is that I'm doing wrong. Tell me all the ways that I can improve that all of the other people ultimately had. The reason I highlight this story is, is that he went from failing step one, which is the bottom 3% of test takers, to a 262 two on his step one practice test, which would be in the top 3% of test takers. He then went on to do substantially better on step two. He was even scoring some of his practice tests 270s. So when he ultimately got a score, he was so relieved. The reason I wanna highlight this story is, is because there's a lot of students that we work with who see these tests, like if you fail one of these tests, it's like a sign of your inadequacy, right? It's like, oh my gosh, I've always worried that I'm not good enough. And so now here is this external sign that I'm not good enough. And it's a really, really crushing blow because I, I think it's easy to conflate our self-worth in medical education with these exam scores. And so this is what happened to this person. What I've learned from this and, and similar experiences is, is that profound personal change requires either desperation or inspiration. If we think really deeply about the times that we've really changed in our lives, yeah, sometimes they were probably from inspiration, but most of the time they came from pain because pain is the catalyst that can push us outside of our comfort zone where we're willing to do things in order to move beyond that pain because the situation that we're in is so much worse than the pain of change. If you yourself are struggling, know that you can use, you can channel that pain into doing the kinds of changes that you probably already know that you need to do. I think one of my favorite things that I've ever heard a student say is that they were glad that they failed. And obviously I don't want students to fail but the reason why they said that was is that failing gave them the opportunity to make changes that they knew deep down they always needed to make. Many of these stories, um, I think, highlight just how powerful your pain can be as an opportunity for growth. So the five themes that we've talked about are commitment, determination, active learning, high quality work quickly, and transforming failure. What do you notice about these themes? For me, what all of these people did was open to all of us. These are all choices that we all can make or not make every single minute of every single day. With the right mindset and strategies, extraordinary results are possible. They're just the product of these accumulated decisions that are gonna grow over time. If you wanna understand the nuances between scoring high on step one versus step two, be sure to check out this video, How to Score 270 Plus by Mastering Step One versus Step Two Differences.